Hello, and welcome back to the live part of the main stage. Uh, that was a great talk. Unfortunately, couldn't join us for a Q&A, but that gives us time for a different type of Q&A. First of a couple of sessions interviewing uh, local CEOs of tech businesses to sort of talk to them about some different access issues. So first, I've got here with me the lovely Louise Morpeth from Brain in Hand, who I've known for a few years now, and I always think does an amazing job and has an amazing company, Brain in Hand, helping people with sort of challenges in living independently to get that independence through a mix of digital technology and, and real world. So I won't tell you too much because much better if Louise explains it herself. So welcome, Louise. Um, so today's conference, as we know, is, is all about access and Brain in Hand is all about supporting those who need more help in living independently. So can you tell us a bit about the aims of, of Brain in Hand? How does it work and, and who does sure. it help? Lovely. Well, it's really lovely to be here. Um, we are interested in disrupting how support is provided for people who are neurodiverse, that's people who are autistic, um, people who have mental health difficulties and people who have learning difficulties. Um, we see that um, those people are significantly excluded from accessing services. So if you just take things like the inequalities that are experienced by autistic people, shorter life expectancy, a higher likelihood of suicide, um, very poor rates of employment. So there's huge barriers if someone is autistic. Um, we are trying to transform the way that people are supported to help them live more independently. Um, we're trying to do that with a hybrid digital tool, so simple digital tools combined with practical human support and all focused on people's strengths to enable them to achieve their goal for independence, which might be something quite modest, like being able to catch the bus, or something quite ambitious about getting a job or going to university. We're all about being user-centred and led by our users and enabling them to achieve the goals that they want to achieve. And that, that's fantastic. So great to see sort of more independence for that community. So um, designing products for with accessibility in mind, I'm looking at things for the NHS at the moment, and, and I know you were part of an NHS programme. How do you go about that? How do you design a digital product with accessibility in mind? Sure. Well, I definitely want to say we've got it cracked, but we're very committed to improving our accessibility. So one of the first things we're doing is... Um, at the moment, completely redesigning our website and redesigning the product look, and we're starting from a neurodiverse first position. So instead of designing something and then adapting it for a neurodiverse audience, we're starting with their requirements. So be things like attending to the colour palette that we use, the layout on the page, making sure it's um, engaging and, and, uh, and easy to use. So Anything that works for someone who's neurodiverse should work for someone who's neurotypical, but it wouldn't necessarily be the other way around. Um, so the look and feel obviously is important. Um, second, the things that we're interested in are we're intentionally not bleeding edge. Um, we want our product to be accessible, which means we support older phones, older operating systems. We don't want our product to make huge demands on people's data. So we're intentionally very data light. We want our product to be widely accessible and not just exclusively for the people who've got the latest mobile phone. And I think the most exciting development, which um, I've championed um, personally, has been getting authentic user engagement. So we have a member of staff who is an expert by experience. He's an autistic young man who's experienced quite serious challenges accessing mm -hmm. services. And he leads our user panel of 15 people who are involved in identifying which features of the product we're going to develop, then prototyping, then testing. So we are very much user-led around product development, and hopefully that, by default, will improve access. That's our assumption. And how, if someone else is looking to do that, how would you suggest sort of finding a person and tapping into those right groups to, to feed in? Well, I um, actually approached Connor because he developed a competitor app. Oh, okay. And I was very cheeky because he'd been posting on social media saying that he didn't think Brain in Hand was up to much. I said, well, come and help us sort it out then. So I think he was so taken aback by my <laughs> cheekiness. That he, and he's been brilliant because he, he, I asked him to review the product warts and all. He told us everything that was wrong with it. And now it's his job, job to systematically tackle all those things that he felt was flawed. So be cheeky. Ask someone who's perhaps your biggest critic to come on board. Well, that, that's fantastic because then, of course, he gets his aim and he gets more Hopefully. traction and he gets an interesting role with you guys so that's, that's fantastic so 
Um, Brain and Hands had seen some great success in the past years. I know you've got a lot of contracts with universities um, and a lot of support around and a lot of things with the NHS. Um, how easy has it been as a sort of Exeter-based business to access those national markets and get that growth? And do you have any advice for, for businesses down here that are growing and any sources of support you might sure. recommend? Well, I think we're very proudly Devon-based. Um, and I think probably a couple of years ago, being Devon-based might have been a disadvantage, um, particularly when it came to attracting, uh, attracting um, technical talent. Um, so we've always had a very open mind about where people are located. I think since the pandemic, obviously, everyone's mindset has changed, so we can now access talent across the UK. So it's only an advantage being Devon-based rather than any sort of disadvantage. I also think if you're in Devon, um, there's a huge amount of support to access if you, if you search it out. So we have had... We we had a grant from the Impact Lab, which um, opened up all sorts of opportunities for us in terms of, for example, a brilliant fundraising event where we got to meet Granted, a local Devon-based consultancy. They helped us with an application to NHS England. We then secured a £700,000 grant. So these little connections and ended up being quite significant. Uh, we've had fabulous support from Set Squared. Um, they, again, gave us a small grant, which enabled us to engage Granted. Um, and they've also introduced us to all sorts of people who have been really fruitful kind of collaborations. The Academic Health Science Network, they're another great um, net network down here. They introduced us to clinicians in the NHS in the Southwest. That was a foundation for our um, SBRI project, which is the Small Business Research Initiative. So probably loads more support that we've had, um, but that's just a start. So, yeah, we've been very fortunate. Yeah, and it's great to, um, to know about all the different things that are available. Just to say, if anyone does have any questions for Louise, then feel free to pop them in the chat for the session and they'll pass them over to me. I don't need to hog all of her time if anyone else has any burning questions. My next one, um, so I know you took over the role of CEO at Brain in Hand uh, two years ago. I think it's your two-year anniversary today. today. Congratulations. So I'm interested in your career path to get to there and, and how you ended up as the CEO of a tech business. Um, well, completely by accident. I've never had a career plan, so this wasn't on the cards. Um, I was running a research uh, organisation until about four years ago and was quite frustrated by we would do great research and then it never felt like it made a difference. So I left the research world, um, consulted for a while, I uh, came across Brain in Hand, did some pro bono work with Brain in Hand and really loved what the business was trying to do. Um, joined them to do R&D and then I was very flattered when they invited me to become chief exec, so it wasn't part of the plan. Um, and then in the last couple of years, even in spite of the pandemic, we've grown, um, we've doubled in size, we've got about 70 staff now, uh, so we're on quite a significant trajectory. Um, but to be totally honest, that wasn't part of the plan. I'd stepped away from doing management and growing an organisation, but it's, um, it's such an exciting product to be part of, and it's such a a nice world to be part of it's kind of like why wouldn't you it's a wonderful opportunity so I don't know if there's any advice there other than if the opportunity's there grab it don't shy away from perhaps not having a path and just doing things that are interesting and what so do you have much of a sort of tech background did you study that sort of thing nope no, no. I, I hate to admit it um my I think what's been valuable is I come from a, a research background and I think the discipline that you have in terms of um thinking logically analyzing problems using data using literature has been a really good foundation um brain in hand is essentially there to improve outcomes for people who um want to be more independent and so research is ideally placed to sort of support that and then we have brilliant technicians and so as long as I can have a conversation with our technologists um, and they can understand what we need I don't need to be a technical expert as long as we can have that bridging conversation between this is the problem we're trying to solve how can we go about that and, and we are very fortunate we have a, a fabulous technical team that we've built up over the last four years so yeah I'm I'm not a technician I'm I have a very ignorant technical background background but that hasn't got in the way so far and do you have any recommendations for other people who might be transitioning from a different sort of area into tech of how you get to 
kind of get in with that language and be able to to communicate with your with your tech team? I, well, I, I think that it's a really good time to be getting into this technology just because everything is still quite nascent. If you think about digital health, it's still a very new field. So it's a good opportunity for people to come in who maybe don't have the technical skills, but you learn quickly. Um, I think probably in five years' time, it'll be very different. There'll be a requirement for people to have more qualifications. It'll be more professionalised. I think at the moment, there's still huge opportunities for people who have um, perhaps got um, a passion about something and can bring a team together. Um, so, yeah, I'd say five years' time might be harder to get into, but right now, uh, if you're bright, enthusiastic, hardworking, lots of opportunities. Yeah, I think uh, Liz, our keynote this morning from KPMG, was saying that passion was the main thing they were looking for in bringing more people into their, their technology team. Um, so one of the biggest access issues, I think, for health tech companies, being in a, a health tech business myself, is, is working with the NHS. Yes. Complicated business to get involved with. And such a key time at the moment, the news is all full of raising income tax in order to try and clear the backlog with the NHS. So do you have any advice on sort of tapping in and getting access to the NHS? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think the first thing most people would say this is the NHS is complex. It's many, many organisations. So the idea that you're going into one is a complete misnomer. Um, I think the second is there are a lot of opportunities now to have assistance to be able to sell into the NHS, things like regional accelerator programmes, national accelerators. So we've taken advantage of all of those. We were part of a regional one. We're now part of the national fellowship. Um, I think you need those because you need not only to help have someone help you navigate the complexities of the NHS, but actually it still also relies on people. You need to be able to talk to people to understand a clinical perspective, a commissioner perspective, an IG perspective. Um, just recently, one of the big developments um, is the publication of something called DTAC. This is the oh, yeah. digital technology assessment criteria that's come from NHSX. It was published in February. Already organisations are requiring tech businesses like ours to comply. This is a complete left field for a lot of us. It, it sort of came very quickly. Um, and unless you can evidence that you can comply with DTAC, that's going to be a major blocker. But that's just one of many things that you don't find out about until you start having the conversations and someone will say, well, are you compliant with this or have you got this standard? Um, so I would say take any adv advice that's on offer and assume that it will take a long time because it is, it's slow. It takes a long time, as everyone who's sold into the NHS will know. <laughs> and, and also this sort of access issue for people with the NHS has obviously become a big thing since the pandemic. Waiting lists are the longest they've ever been. It's a big crisis. And, and you were telling me that, you know, people uh, with neurodiverse issues, they, they have extra struggles in accessing that care and accessing the right care. Can you tell us a bit more about, about that and what, what sure. sort of things you can help them with? Yeah, I mean, the waiting lists now, if you're an adult and you're looking to get a diagnosis for autism, um, some trusts aren't even publishing the waiting times because they're two, three years and more. So you've got a double whammy, really. You have health inequalities that are experienced by people who are neurodiverse, and then access to services is getting worse. However, I think with the pandemic, um, mental health is being prioritised. There are quite a lot of opportunities for organisations like Brain in Hand and, and similar to apply for funding to help address these issues. And so the, um, the Small Business Research Initiative has currently got a call out if people have got a digital mental health technology that's suitable for young people. There's an opportunity there. Um, for us, what we're trying to do is offer something to people who are on waiting lists, because if you're sitting there waiting, it could be many years until you get some support. Um, people can come to Brain in Hand and have something practical um, quickly uh, without having to go through the process of being assessed and, and uh, assigned a service. So that's what we're trying to do, trying to help relieve the waiting list situation when it comes to people who are neurodiverse. Well, thank you so much, Louise. That has been really exciting. I, I still think you, you know, Brain in Hand does something really fantastic, really valuable 
for such uh, a key part of the community. So I look forward to watching that continue to grow. Thanks very much. Um, so if anyone does want to ask Louise any questions later on, uh, you can put them in the chat and she might, she might check it out Absolutely. later. But thank you so much for joining us. We're going to move on to uh, our next talk from Steve Lee. So Steve is in the middle of a field somewhere right now, so unfortunately won't be joining us live. Um, he will be responding on Twitter if you have any questions for him. But So I'm here to, to tee him up. Uh, Steve is, is madly in love with tech. He, as he's written himself, he's a software developer at heart who fell in love with the web a while ago. His mission is to ensure the web remains empowering for everybody. Practically, that means working on improving its accessibility to people through standards, web technologies, content design, browser features, and assistive technology. Steve works for the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative Group, using his skills to help develop resources and tools. So we will go to the recording of the presentation he made a couple of weeks ago, and any questions, pop them on the chatter into Twitter.